Why do cows have hooves instead of feet? Because they lack toes. Welcome back to another episode of the Learn, Dream, Do Show. Today we're going to talk about all things dairy. That means milk, cheese, yogurt, ice cream, and all the different places milk can come from. Don't worry, we'll have some butter jokes coming up. Try this. It is I, the great Moodini, with a magic trick just for you. Here are the items that you'll need for today's magic milk. You'll need some whole milk. Whole milk works best. You can experiment with 1% and 2%, but the whole milk really works the best for this. You'll need some liquid dish detergent, some liquid food coloring, not the gel, some Q-tips, and finally, a shallow dish like a plate or bowl. The first step is to go ahead and pour the milk so it just covers the bottom of whatever plate or dish you're using. Next, I'm gonna take the food coloring and just put some drops in the center of my plate. And now time to make the magic happen. I'm gonna dip the end of my Q-tip into my dish detergent and then I'm gonna put it onto the plate and we're gonna watch the magic happen. You can keep adding drops of soap to keep the reaction going and the colors moving. Now you're probably wondering what's going on here. Milk is mostly made up of water, however it does have minerals and fat in it. Whenever you add the drop of dish soap, that soap is actually chasing after the fat molecules in the milk. Normally we wouldn't be able to see this process because milk is one color. However, when you add the food coloring, you can watch everything move around. Did you know? Cows have best friends too! Scientists have studied the social bonds between them and have found that if a cow can be with her best friend, she's happier, healthier, and produces more milk! Do all dairy products come from cows? Nope. They can come from all kinds of animals, depending on where in the world you live and the type of climate that you live in. Let's take a look at a few different kinds and see how they compare. Cow's milk is the most common kind we have here in the United States. It's yellowish white in color, it tastes mild and sweet, and is used to make butter, cheese, yogurt, sour cream, ice cream, dolce de leche, and more. Sheep's milk is a buttery yellow color and tastes sweeter than cow and goat milk. It's most often used in yogurt and cheese making. Lots of famous cheeses are made from sheep's milk. It has more fat, protein, vitamin C, and calcium than cow milk, and makes more cheese per gallon of milk than the cow variety because of that higher protein and fat content. Goat's milk is white and tastes similar to cow milk, but can be tangy and goaty, depending on the proximity of bucks to the milking does. People with dairy sensitivities can often digest goat milk because it has a lower lactose content than cow milk. Goat milk is used to make cheese, yogurt, ice cream, cajeta, which is a variety of dulce de leche, and more. It's also used in soaps and lotions. Yak milk is most commonly found in the Himalayan region. Yak's milk is pink or white and tastes sweet and rich with a strong fragrance. It has more fat, protein, calcium, and iron than cow milk, and is used to make the famous butter tea, as well as beverages like milk wine. It's also used to make churpi or durka cheese and butter. The butter is used as lamp fuel, to polish fur coats, and as a medium for traditional Tibetan sculpture. Water buffalo don't like to be milked, so it's often harder to find and more expensive to buy. If you can get it, the milk is white and tastes creamy and mild. It's often used to make mozzarella, paneer, koa, kheer, ghee, yogurt, and more. This kind of milk is more common in India. Buffalo milk has more calories, butter fat, protein, and calcium than cow's milk, and also has less cholesterol and lactose. Even camels and reindeer can be milked. The extreme cold of Scandinavia and the extreme heat of the Arabian Peninsula and other desert areas mean that cows can't survive there. Camel milk is white 
It tastes salty and sweet and has less fat, protein, and lactose than cow milk. However, it has more vitamin C than the cow variety. It can be used to make butter and cheese, but neither are easily done. This type is most often consumed as plain milk or fermented into other drinks. Sometimes you can even find it in high-end chocolate. Hello, I'm Jim Hill, CEO of Southwest and Southland Dairy Farmers, an organization representing dairy farms and farm families dedicated to making sure dairy and dairy products continue to be an important nutritional part of America's diet. From our beginning, one of our ongoing initiatives has been to show America's young people the role our dairy farmers play in feeding our nation. So while we can't give all of you a field trip to the farms, we made it possible to bring our farms to you. Our mobile dairy classroom is a dairy farm on wheels. With it, we teach kids where milk comes from and why it's good for them, how it gets to their family's table, how to milk a live cow, and how dairy farms care for their animals and the environment. When you drink milk, you're gonna get nine nutrients in your body. Let's list those nutrients. We have vitamin A, we have calcium, vitamin D, vitamin B12, potassium, riboflavin, niacin, phosphorus and protein. By getting these nine nutrients in your body, it's going to help your blood flow through your body. It even helps your eyesight. It helps your bones get stronger, your teeth get stronger. Athletes love to drink milk for their protein, for their uh, muscles. Now, let's talk about where that milk comes from. Milk comes from a a cow. Today I brought Belle the Jersey dairy cow to share with you. But there are different breeds of dairy cows. We have Ayrshire, Guernsey, Jersey, Brown Swiss, Holstein, Milking Shorthorn, and the Red and White Holstein. So let's look at what a dairy farm looks like. This is an example. They come in all shapes and sizes, just like your schools come in all shapes and sizes. Did you know cows don't sweat like we do? So we have to keep them cool and comfortable in the summertime, warm in the wintertime. We have what we call a herringbone. You may have cows on both sides of you. We have what we call a carousel. We can milk numerous cows at one time. You'll see these carousel or rotary barns. There are 72 cows being milked at one time on this carousel milking parlor. These cows step on, the milkers are put on the cow. They make a 10 minute trip in a circle riding the carousel. Once they're finished, the milkers are taken off, that cow steps off and the next cow steps on. That gets a lot of cows milked quickly during the day. But today we have robotics. We actually can go do other things while the cows are being milked by a robot. But before we can milk the cows, there's always something we have to do, and that is prepare the cows to give us milk. I don't want to just walk up to Belle and start milking her. I want to make sure Belle is ready, but I also want to make sure she's clean. So to clean the cow, what we're going to do is wash the cow's udder off. Her udder is where she makes and stores us her milk. She has one udder, but the udder is divided into four parts. Each part has a quarter just like four quarters to a dollar, well, four quor uh, quarters to her udder. And what we're gonna clean her with, this is an iodine solution. Some of you may use Germex, hand sanitizer to clean your hands. This is basically just like that. This is an iodine wash. We're simply gonna spray the cow's four parts. And then we're simply gonna grab a clean paper towel and we're gonna wipe this off. Now, not only is this washing the cow, this is also letting the cow know you're gonna get some milk from her. Actually, by washing the cow, she's gonna start relaxing so she can let us have her milk. The cow gets nervous in any type of way, she can't hold her milk up from us for just a little bit. 
We want to get this milk from the cow as quickly as we can. We talked about the dairy farmers milking the cows by hand. We're going to just take a little bit of milk by hand from the cow from each quarter. This machine is more sanitary and it's more economical for the dairy farmer. We can simply milk our cows a lot faster. We have multiple machines. When I turn this valve, there's going to be just a slight suction that's going to go on the cow's udder. Just feels like you're barely squeezing your finger. And it's going to take the milk through the suction, through this milk hose, and into what we have a whey jar. Once we've milked the cows, we're going to store the milk in a bulk tank. We're going to cool that milk down because it is about 101 degrees, just like our body temperature. So we want to cool it down as fast as we can. And we're going to cool it down to 36 degrees. And from there, we're going to wait for a tanker truck to come pick that milk up. But before he picks that milk up, we're going to take a sample of that milk and we're going to test it. We're going to make sure that it's clean, healthy, safe, and that it's antibiotic free. There is absolutely no antibiotics in any milk that you buy from the store. Once we get to the processing plant with the tanker truck, we're going to test the milk. We're going to test it for different types of components and also to make sure it's healthy, clean, and safe. Once we test it and we know that it's safe and it's healthy and it's clean, we can process the milk. There are two steps to processing milk. The first step is pasteurization. Pasteurization is just a process to ensure the safety of our milk once again. We're going to heat that milk up to 165 degrees for 15 seconds and we're going to cool it right back down. Once we pasteurize milk, we're going to homogenize the milk. That's just a process that's going to break up the fat particles in your milk because as milk sets, it's going to have the cream rise to the top. So this process will just break the fat particles up so you don't have to shake your milk up before you drink it. After we pasteurize and homogenize your milk, we're going to process it. We're going to turn it into all the delicious dairy products and milk that we enjoy every single day. Okay, tell me if you've heard this one. There was a farmer out in the field counting all the cows. There were 196 of them. But when he rounded them up, there were 200. Have you ever wondered why milk is always stocked at the very back of the store? Well, there's two reasons for this, and both of them deal with how you buy or economics. The first reason milk is at the back of the store is because milk trucks deliver behind facilities and it's easier to pull the milk out and store them in a nearby refrigerator to keep them from spoiling. And the second reason is because it makes the consumer, you, buy more things. Stores hope that your stroll to the back of the store to pick up the milk makes you see other things you want to buy and spend more money. We've already learned today from Southwest Dairy Farmers that milk isn't just for drinking and that it's used to make cheese, ice cream, butter, and more. However, some people aren't able to digest milk well. We call this being lactose intolerant. Lactose is a sugar in milk that cannot be absorbed by our bodies as an adult. As a baby, your body produces an enzyme called lactase that was able to break down the lactose into simple sugars that the body could absorb. About 50% of the world's population is lactose intolerant. Fast fact, about 90% of East Asians are lactose intolerant, as opposed to only about 5% of Northern Europeans. So what do people do who are lactose intolerant? Does that mean they can't have any ice cream? No milk for their morning cereal? No cheese on their nachos? Or butter in their mashed potatoes? Oh no, this is a travesty. Okay, maybe I'm going a little overboard here. There are several ways that people who are lactose intolerant can combat it and enjoy foods with dairy. One way is for them to slowly build up their lactose tolerance by exposing their bodies to dairy. Over time, their bodies will restart the process of digesting lactose. However, this doesn't always work and it's a good idea to talk to your doctor before trying this. Another way around lactose intolerance is to use dairy-free options. There are a lot of options out there. Soy milk, almond milk, coconut milk, oat milk, rice milk, cashew milk, macadamia milk, hemp milk, pea milk, peanut milk, walnut milk, flax milk. Now you might be asking, how do we get milk out of soybeans or from almonds? The same way you get it out of a cow. You squeeze it out. Uh, 
Uh, that didn't work so well, so let's find out how you really get milk out of an almond, and this is something that you can do at home. The first step in making almond milk is to soak the almonds overnight. Next, we'll pulverize the almonds in a blender to chop them up and make them into much smaller pieces. At this point, some recipes suggest adding sweeteners like dates or honey. Vanilla is also a common ingredient to add. This mixture gets put into a cloth bag and squeezed either by hand or by an industrial press. The cloth bag helps to remove anything that didn't quite get chopped up enough in the blender. And voila, you now have fresh almond milk. Today I am in my kitchen because I'm going to be making fresh butter in a contest of woman versus machine. Fresh milk from a cow is very rich. If you leave it overnight, most of the fat will float to the top. We call that cream, and it's removed from the milk before it gets to you. Butter comes from this high fat portion. It just needs to be agitated. Not like that. Agitated can also mean to stir something briskly. Fun fact, you can agitate milk from the store all day and you'll never get butter. The cream has already been taken off. I'm going to be separating butter with this mason jar and with my mixer. Which do you think will go faster? But which do you think is the better workout? I'll start by putting cold, heavy cream into both, then get agitating. for the woman and the machine. Now that the butter's done, I'm using a fine sieve to drain as much of the liquid as possible. That's buttermilk. I'm going to save it and use it to make pancakes. Then I'm going to rinse the butter three times in cold water. And it's done and ready to be mixed with anything I want to add. Salt, honey, herbs. I'm going with salt and fresh thyme and mashing it in with a fork. A trio of herbed butters, you say? Tell me more. Why, yes, madam, we have three herbed butters. On the left, we have fresh butter churned by hand in a jar. In the middle, we have fresh butter churned in a mixer. And on the right, we have butter from the store. Now, which one will I like the best? Hmm. Well, it's almost a toss-up between the two fresh butters. I must say, the store-bought butter just tastes fridgy to me. But the butter that was mixed in the jar, I really have to say, is the most creamy, and I'm going to declare it the winner. I was going to make a joke about dairy, but it's a little too cheesy. <laughs> Milk has been an important source of nutrients for thousands of years, but people had to get creative and find ways to store it. Fresh milk goes bad quickly, but people discovered a great way to preserve the nutrients. They made it into cheese, and the science of cheese has come a long way in a few millennia. The first step in modern cheese making is called pasteurization. Pasteurization is named after French scientist Louis Pasteur, a leading bacteria scientist. The process of pasteurizing milk means it gets heated to a specific temperature that's too hot for any bacteria. This kills off any of the germs that might make people sick. But specific types of good bacteria and fungus are key to the cheese making process. Their job is to eat all the sugar or lactose found in milk, so they get added back in along with a product called rennet. Once this happens, they get to work eating the sugar and making it into acid. When acid, rennet, and the good kinds of bacteria and fungi are present, the milk separates into solids and liquids. The solid pieces are called curds, and those form the base for the cheeses that we know and love. The liquid is called whey, and it gets drained out after the curds form. We do this because the water contained in the whey would make it spoil really quickly. 
After the whey is drained, then the cheese curds get mixed with salt. Some fresh cheeses stop here, like cottage cheese. But lots of other cheeses keep going, and their next step is being pressed, or having the extra whey squeezed out. For some types of cheese, like cheddar, the salt is mixed in and then they get pressed. For other types, like feta or halloumi, they get put in a tank with really salty water called a brine. To help preserve the cheese, the salt creates an environment that keeps away bad bacteria, and the good bacteria ferments the cheese. That fermentation is what makes the holes in Swiss cheese, the lovely sharp flavor of cheddar and parmesan, and the creamy texture of brie. Once all the salt is added, some cheeses get covered in wax. Some have special good fungi added, and others get vacuum sealed before they move on to the final step. The very last step in cheese making is called aging, and this happens in a dark, cool place like a cave. Some cheeses age for a day, and others can age for years before it's ready to eat. It's time for Shakespeare Says. Heavens defend me from that Welsh fairy, lest he transform me to a piece of cheese. This has been Shakespeare Says. The cheese stands alone. The cheese stands alone. Hi ho, the dairy o. The cheese stands alone. People need protein in our diet because it helps our bodies repair cells and make new ones. Dairy, like milk, has a lot of protein in it, but milk is very perishable, so it goes bad after a while. This one expires in about a week. Turning milk into cheese makes it less perishable, so you don't have to eat it right away. This block of cheese says that it's best if used within a couple of months from now. Oh, and both the milk and the cheese have a note on their labels that says to keep them refrigerated. A little over a hundred years ago, people figured out how to make processed cheese, like this powdery stuff. It's much less perishable. Processed cheese is one of the cheapest proteins possible, so it makes sense that macaroni and cheese became super popular in the 1900s. Pasta and processed cheese are both very cheap to make. They're easy to ship and store, and it fills you up. Macaroni and cheese is one of my favorite comfort foods, whether it's the convenient kind that I just heat up in the microwave, or the kind my family makes with real cheese grated up and melted into a roux. My brother-in-law even makes a spicy version with ghost peppers. The invention of processed cheese means now we can keep dairy out on a shelf for months and months without it going bad and without worrying about if the flavor is going to change. Do you like mac and cheese? What kind? Try this! have all this talk about dairy and not include anything about ice cream, so let's make some. In order to make ice cream, you're going to need a cup of half and half, a cup of sugar, a half cup of regular milk, and a half teaspoon of vanilla extract to get that vanilla flavor. You're also going to need a large and small Ziploc bag, ice, and a cup of ice cream salt. Regular salt is okay to use, but did you know that stores actually have ice cream salt? This salt has bigger crystals than regular salt and decreases the time it takes for your ice cream to form. The first thing we're gonna do is grab our small bag and I'm gonna place it inside of a cup to help it stand up. Then I'm gonna pour in a cup of sugar, a cup of half and half, which is actually half cream and half milk, a half cup of regular milk, and then a half teaspoon of vanilla extract and then mix them together. If you would like to change the color of your ice cream, add some food coloring to your bag right now. But remember, the food coloring will only change the color of your ice cream, not the flavor. Then you're gonna zip up the bag and put it on the side. Now I'm gonna grab my large bag that I've already filled halfway with ice and I'm gonna sprinkle a cup of the ice cream salt in the bag. 
We're adding salt to the ice because as the ice begins to melt, the salt helps it get extremely cold and that helps our liquid transform into the texture of ice cream. Now it's time to shake our ice cream. I hope you have strong muscles because you're gonna have to shake your bag for at least five minutes to get soft serve ice cream. I like my ice cream more firm, so I'm gonna have to shake the bag even longer and check on it every now and then to see if I achieve the texture that I like. The salt on the ice will make the Ziploc bag extremely cold and it can give you frostbite on your fingers. So grab a towel or a t-shirt and place it around the bag before you start shaking. After you're finished shaking, add your favorite toppings and yay, ice cream. I hope you had fun learning all about dairy with us today. To learn even more, you can look up any of those animals that produce milk like cows, goats, sheep, or water buffalo, or try to find out more about milk and dairy products. You can also find a range of cookbooks in our library collection that have recipes whether you eat dairy or want to try some dairy-free options. To watch the full Southwest Dairy Farmers Mobile Dairy Classroom video, visit southwestdairyfarmers.com. Right now, they'll let you experience the Mobile Dairy Classroom from their homepage. Click the blue MDC Watch Us Now button, then scroll down and play the video to learn even more about dairy nutrition, how the Southwest Dairy Farmers take care of cows, and where milk comes from. You can also explore AmericanDairy.com. Click on Dairy Farms to learn more about dairy farmers, dairy cows, and lots of interesting dairy facts. They also have virtual farm tour videos for elementary, middle, and high school students. Thanks for watching. We hope you'll learn, dream, and do with us again next time.